With Miller Mott College's online programs, you can choose when you study. Our online programs give you the flexibility to make education work with your schedule. Earn your degree without derailing your life. Visit us online at miller-mott.edu. That's miller-mott.edu. Hi, my name is Richard Dix, and this is How Did That Happen? A podcast where I look at everyday things or events and try to figure out how they came to be. Every week I will research one topic, and by the end of the episode, I hope to truly have the answer to the question, how did that happen? Hello, and welcome to another episode of How Did That Happen? This week, we are discussing bowling. Was it always in alleys, or did it used to be on the main street too? Come along for the ride this week as I ask, bowling, how did that happen? Bowling can be traced to about 7,000 years ago, in the year 5200 BC in Egypt, and that's when they, the Egyptians, uh, they painted hieroglyphics. Uh, in a royal tomb that depicted them bowling, and that's the one they were able to date what they found back to to that time. Um, they we even found a miniature bowling set in a child's tomb in Egypt. And it's not if you look at the pictures which they're out there, it's not it doesn't look exactly like ten pin bowling that you would see in a bowling alley, but it's essentially the same thing of you know put some pins up and and roll a ball towards it and see what happens. I mean that was seven thousand years ago, and they already had that idea. The Romans had a game uh, that was similar, but it was more akin to bocce ball than actual bowling. Uh, in, in, in 400 AD, Germany began using bowling as a ritual to cleanse oneself, which just sounds a, a wild, I'll just say. They used rocks as bowling balls. In 1185, the Hospital of God's House was founded for religious pilgrims. It is located on the southern coast of Great Britain. On that property, there was a patch of grass by the hospital that had been reserved for the recreational use of the warden. It was called the Southampton Bowling Green. It was first used to bowl in 1299 and it is still in use today. Bowling was done on lawns at this point, and it would continue to be done so for centuries. In addition to lawns, in places like Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, different services were used, like cinders or baked clay. In 1366, King Edward III banned bowling because it was distracting his soldiers from archery practice, which just, you know, this, that bowling must have just been super interesting. In 1455, they put roofs over the lawn bowling, and in Germany, these, these you know, roofed lawn bowling areas, areas were called Kegelbahns and were sometimes attached to taverns or guest houses. And you really see, um, even, even when we get later on down into it, it's that the Germans really do kind of pioneer, and al- along with the Dutch, do kind of pioneer the American bowling movement when it, when it, when it, when it finally does come over um, across, across the uh, Atlantic. In 1511, King Henry VIII of England banned bowling for lower class people and made the lanes private so that only those who could pay could play, which is just another way to class people out and make it so, you know, rich people have something else they have that poor people don't. Um, this was an interesting fact, but I, I, I guess could, I could put in the, I didn't know before, but I just thought it kind of went with this whole thing was that even, you know, around this, this time, Martin Luther, the guy who, you know, the, tried to, the father of Protestantism, I guess you could say. He had a bowling alley attached to his house, or a bowling green, if you will, attached to his house, which I just read that, and I was just like, I literally was like, wow. <laughs> like, I did not know that bowling got this deep. When English explorer Henry Hudson settled New Amsterdam, which would later become New York, in 1609, among the provisions brought with them were the equipment for lawn bowling. This is kind of what I was talking about, about how the, the Europeans would bring their love for bowling over to America, and that's you know, kind of where the seeds of, 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 of America's love for bowling were, were planted. In 1617, uh, King James I of England created the Declaration of Sports, sometimes called the Book of Sports, which banned bowling on Sundays. So it seems like a lot of kings were really into controlling bowling. I would controlling bowling. I would just would I would have never thought that. So you know, like I guess that's I would have not in a million years. Um, the book explained that the book explained the types of sports that were allowed on Sundays. Um, it should be said that the back then the bowling was often grouped together with gambling. Like we said, it was attached to taverns sometimes, so I guess it could probably get a little, you know, debaucherous. Um, and it was viewed in a negative light in some circles. The Declaration allowed archery on Sundays, but only after the attendance of an Anglican service. And I wonder how they were able to keep track of that. You know, it was like a head count in church, and then like, well, that guy can't play. He didn't show up. Like, how do you know? Like, I just I changed clothes. Like, how do you, you know? It was devised as a way to get back at the Catholics who didn't go to church in their town, which is, you know, it's really just another way to be petty for people to be petty against each other. And it's kind of hard to explain. There's more information about it on this Wikipedia page um, that it's gonna, definitely going to explain it better than I am because it started, it started in a small town and eventually became national, but the small town where they were just having like trouble with like the Catholics and the Protestants there and them also trying to play games, it's a little ridiculous. 
like I said, um, initially the decoration was only for one town in England, but eventually it went national and then it was reconfirmed in 1633 by King Charles I. Once again, so many kings who really, they had, you would think they have so much more things to do than care about who and, and, and when people bowl. Um, let's see, the, the book, as it should, the book was publicly burned in 1643, and from then on, you could bowl on Sundays in England. So if you go to England right now on a Sunday, there'll be people bowling. You can't yell at them because that, that law was, was, you know, that was, the book was burned 400 years ago. As stated, there has been bowling in New York since 1609. The oldest park in New York City is called Bowling Green. And when it was created in 1733, it originally had bowling greens. And it still stands today. There's pictures of it online. I, I was in New York a couple months ago and, and didn't even think to look over here. But it's, it's, in, it's in Manhattan. And you can see all, all these big buildings. And then there's just one little park, you know, like one little itty-bitty like, circle. And it's, but it's interesting to know it's been there for 300 years. Let's see. There, there have been variations of how many bowling pins that were used from throughout this entire time. We talked about, like I said, originally with the, with the Egyptians, it wasn't even, I mean, it was, it was like, I may, I may post a picture on the Twitter account. Like it's bowling in like the loosest sense of bowling. Like it's, you know what I mean? It's not, you're, it's not, you're not, not going to find out your local AMF, but like, so it, it changes the amount of pins people use. Eventually the number was finalized to 10 and that, you know, started when the products uh, were being made, were sent out as opposed to being constructed with whatever they could be found around the house. You know, before, um, there was like one company which we're about to talk about. People were just making this stuff at their house, and so how are you gonna tell that that guy he can't have his pins this about a distance from his foul line and how many pins he wants to bowl with or whatever? But in 1880, the Brunswick Corporation, which up until that time had only made billiard materials, began making bowling balls and accessories. They even started to make and ship the wood that would that would create the bowling alley, like the actual alleys, you know, that that we know and love. They were initially installed in pubs which explains the connection between drinking and bowling and why there is always a bar and a bowling alley. The first governing body in America was set up in 1895 in New York City. It was called the National Bowling Association, the NBA, and founded by local clubs that wanted to kind of come together. They standardized the amount of pins used at 10, as well as the ball size and distance, distance between the foul line and, and, and the pins. Um, this was originally a men's-only club, as most things were during that time, and the women were forced to make their own called the Women's International Bowling Congress. I think it's interesting to note that when the women made theirs the first time, they made it international, and the men just kind of kept it national, just, just a distinction. So the, the International Bowling Con Congress would eventually merge with the American Bowling Congress in 2005, so it only took 110 years, to create the United States Bowling Congress. The bowling balls used during this time were made out of lignum vi vi vitae, um, yep, which is a Caribbean hardwood. But the balls have been made out of all types of different materials like rubber, polyester resin, and the more modern ones are made with a urethane shell. And I mean, that's an interesting thing if you have nothing to do is to go on YouTube and watch how a bowling ball gets made. It'll take up two minutes of your time. Up until the late 19th century, some balls were made with only two holes, one for the thumb and one for one of the other four fingers. In 1905, England created the first English Bowling Association, and that same year, the first international bowling board was created. I guess they don't count the, uh, the women's international couple. You know, while, while some women bowled before the 20s, it was prohibition during that time that drove the bowling alleys out of saloons and bars and made them a more family-friendly activity. So it's really, we really probably have prohibition to thank for why, like, if, for, for why basically bowling became a family activity because who knows, had, not, had that not have happened, it, bowling could have just it could have just been relegated to, to another kind of like just a drinking game a bar drinking game that never got taken like in the mainstream it's an interesting thing to think about the prohibition could have been the reason really why bowling alleys are, are like as ubiquitous as like applebee's in 1950 the american bowling congress integrated their ranks allowing membership from african americans and other minorities and this was done due to the pressure put upon them by mlb by mlb's integration a few years before at this, it, it, it's interesting because at this time, professional bowlers and professional baseball players made about the same amount of money, and so that's why it was they were it was like they had to they kind of had to move in the same circles at that time. It's like oh well, the MLB let Jackie Robinson in, and like so, but it's like now there's not much that would happen to where oh the bowlers are doing this, so the MLB better do that. But during that time, they were they were, they were actually around equal as far as the amount of money they made. In 1959, competition began in the Pro Bowlers Association which would become the authority on all things bowling. It began in Akron, Ohio. While bowling had been on television before the formation of this group, it was the PBA that spearheaded this endeavor and brought bowling to the big three TV networks in the early 60s. 
To this day, the PBA still remains the governing body of professional bowling. And that is how bowling happened. And now it's time for the roundup. The roundup. The roundup. And we're going to round it up. The Egyptians were bowling 7,000 years ago. The oldest known bowling green is, in the, is at the Hospital of God's House in England, created in 1185. The bowling green eventually gets roofed and attached to taverns, creating a symbiotic relationship between bars and bowling that would last until the modern days. The Dutch and the German have a hand in making bowling popular in America due to their immigration and being big where they came from. Prohibition leads to bowling coming out of the bars and into more family-friendly establishments, and the PBA puts it on TV and makes it a household name starting in the 60s. Things, things I, I didn't know before. Okay, so some things that I didn't know before. First, first off, I didn't know bowling was so old at all. When I started this, I thought this, this history might go, might go like two or three hundred years. I'm so that's I did not know that. Um, I did also not know that so many kings uh, throughout history cared so much about bowling. It seems like such a mundane thing to give your time to, especially when most of those dudes were dealing with like wars and famines too. At the or is it famines? A singular? I don't. You know, dealing with that at the same time, but at the same, but also, you know, during that, they're just like, well, you can only bowl this way on Sunday, but like, you know, don't die from this disease that everyone's dying from. Um, and the, the early bowling balls were made of wood. I guess I didn't know what they were. I also just like I don't know. Bowling doesn't enter my brain too much throughout the week, but like I never would have thought. Um, you know that vite that whatever that was that I mis mispronounced earlier. Um, that vite. Uh, the 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 nickname uh, another thing is the and this is I did not know and it's kind of ridiculous but not that ridiculous the nickname for the person because all the bowling alley the most of them and they're, they're put, the pin setting machines are automatic they don't have hand they're not done by per, by, pe by people anymore um, but the person who watches that machine and makes sure that the machine does its job is called the pin chaser or in some circles it's called the pin monkey which it's just like where do they get this from. Um, and this has been another episode of How Did That Happen? Uh, I want to say thank you for listening, especially the people who come back uh, week to week and keep listening to me talk about how things happen. I appreciate it. Uh, the podcast is growing a little bit. I, I hear your feedback, you know, and I'm working on it about the audio and all, all the other stuff. I'm definitely, I, I take it all in and uh, keep it coming. I have, I have no, no problem with that stuff, man. Just like, let me hear what you think. Um, I am, I'm your host, Richard Dix. Um, be, be sure to like, rate, and subscribe if you can, and I'll see you guys next week. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry, we were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. ChumbaCasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered ChumbaCasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby. Mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa. Take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba Life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Ch -ch -chumba. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.